Um, so this is the second part, so the second flow. So far we discussed how we can harness that, how we can harness energy from air in motion. Here is how we can harness energy from, uh, uh, from water, from high quantities of water, right? So the key things I'll explain will be similar to the presentation to the, to the lecture on wind. It's the key uh, principle, the key formula that you need to have in mind to understand hydro and then show the integration and also how hydro is implemented in the model you're using in the project. Because I thought it can be interesting for you to understand a bit what's behind uh, in these uh, complicated files you have, uh, uh, apart from the Excel file you have for, for, your, uh, for your project, right? So actually, at the end of the lecture, I will ask you to find the mistake in this calculation. So some years ago, if you were around EPFL doing your bachelor or master's and so on, there was this person that uh, was hanging posters around EPFL, uh, basically saying that wind, that hydro does, pumped hydro doesn't make any sense, because he was saying if we have wind turbines in Neuchâtel and we have a, a storage in Nam de Drans in, in uh, Valais, then we'll have around 10% losses in the grid, 80% losses in the pump, 80% losses in the turbine, and 10% losses in the grid to, to go back to Neuchâtel. So according to his calculation, the efficiency of a wind plus hydro system was uh, around uh, 3%. So there is some mistake in this calculation that, uh, that, you can, uh, that you can look more in detail, and I'll ask you at the end to identify. So again, some basics, uh, you know that we have, uh, again, also hydro as wind ultimately comes from the sun. So it's solar energy that causes the oceans. Water is mostly concentra concentrated in oceans. Uh, solar energy with heat causes evaporation of the water. Uh, wind, which is again caused by sun, uh, brings uh, the clouds over the land. And this gives us uh, the precipitation, which gives us the potential energy we need to harvest hydro. And also hydro has been exploited since the early days of uh, civilization. Actually, there is a, in the, in the, already in uh, the second, uh, in the third century uh, after Christ, there was a quite big installation uh, in France, in uh, France, uh, of hydro, which was uh, which is which is known as the biggest installation, the biggest non-concentration of mechanical power in the ancient history. So it was about 50 kilowatt. If you imagine that today the biggest power plant in the world is a hydropower plant that we'll see now, we'll see later, and it's 22 gigawatt, is the equivalent of uh, 22 nuclear power plants altogether. You see, you can understand that. Uh, we have made some um, progress in terms of technology and also in terms of society. Uh, hydro is by far the most uh, mature and the most developed uh, renewable. So usually when you look in statistics, you find the data about hydro and then you find the data about other renewables apart from hydro. It covers around 16% of the overall uh, uh, world electricity production and it is also growing uh, it is also growing, uh, of course, um, for example, in countries like Switzerland, which, has very, which is very developed for hydro, it has almost reached its maximum potential. But in, in the other countries, people are trying to use as much hydro as they can because it's a well-known, mature, and uh, affordable resource. Compared to wind, as you remember this graph I showed you before, how wind is growing so fast. If you compare it to large hydropower plants, they are also growing. But especially in Europe, they are definitely more stable than uh, wind. This is because of their resource. In Europe, we are already using quite a lot of hydro where we have it. We have a lot of hydro in Switzerland. We have a lot of hydro in Italy, also in the Scandinavian countries. So we cannot increase it as much as we would like to, especially for high, for very big dams. And anyway, in Europe, it represents uh, about 15% of the electricity production. It's still the biggest renewable in Europe, although solar and wind are growing very fast, especially, especially wind will probably overtake hydro in some years. And if we look in Switzerland, so we said wind, we don't have almost any wind in Switzerland. Hydro, we have a lot of hydro in Switzerland. If you look at the entire Swiss electricity production, uh, the net production is around 57 terawatt hours a year. So uh, as you remember, total energy consumption is 236. So we are about um, one, one fourth of the energy is electricity and around 60% of the Swiss gross electricity production is uh, coming from hydro. And it's mostly half and half 
between dams and uh, uh, reverse installation. And I'll, I'll discuss more about Switzerland in the end. I just want to show you this graph. This shows you quite a, an important topic in Switzerland, is that this is the demand of electricity in, in, uh, in black. This is the production of electricity. You can see that you have some, you have the fact that this, what is called here, uh, the Centralo Fidelo, so the uh, runoff river power plants, have a strong seasonality. Of course, we have, uh, we don't, we cannot use uh, rivers when the water is frozen in the, in the mountains or in form of snow, right? So we have an abundance of electricity in uh, winter. We have a deficit in summer. So this is the situation in Switzerland today. And uh, this, this also explains, and I'll show you later, how, why and how the, the turbines are and the dams are operating in a given way in Switzerland, which is accounted for in the model you're using. If we look at the projection, hydro is expected to increase. Uh, from different estimates and so on, you get to numbers which are around 8,000 to 15,000 terawatt hours a year on the global level, which basically means that it will cover 30 to 40 percent of the global electricity worldwide. And this graph shows you that the undeveloped that in, in Europe we are using more than 50 percent of the capacity of the potential that we have. So in Europe, actually, is where hydro is mostly used today. In other countries, there is still quite a lot of unexploited potential, and that's where the developments are coming. Okay. We have basically two types of hydropower stations. We have the run of the river power plants, which are basically just installations that are working thanks to the flow of the river. Usually you have big mass flows. You have almost no storage, so you have to accept the water when it comes. You, you, you don't have really any storage before. And it is also highly seasonal, as I said, because of course it depends a lot on the precipitation and the snow. And then you have the possibility of storing water. So the storage of water, you can do it in dams. You have the possibility of storing hydro, either in normal lakes, artificial lakes, uh, just to store this high potential and produce electricity when you need it and want it. And then you have also the possibility, and we'll talk about better in the next uh, in the next lecture about storage, to use hydro as a way of storing and balancing uh, the grid. I would say when we talk about pump storage, normally we refer to day, night, let's say short-term storage. We actually in Switzerland the main role of storage is about seasonal effects, and I'll explain that uh, in the part on Switzerland at the end. What are the main physics of hydro? So there is a bit less equation compared to wind. Actually, hydro is pretty simple under the, the key equations that we have to know. First of all, we have to remember that it is a low density resource. So if we have one kilogram of water at 100 meter height, we have only one kilojoule per kilogram, right? So 100 meters times around 10 meters per second square, which is the gravity acceleration. Compare, for example, to the, to the power of uh, other fuels, it is definitely much less compared to fossil fuels. So it means the specific energy is very low. It means the kilograms need to be very high. So we need to have a lot of quantity. And the physics of hydro are basically coming all from one key equation, which is again the same one we saw for wind, and it is uh, the Bernoulli equation. So. The key equation is that if we have water uh, flowing in a pipe at any point x, we can express the total amount of specific energy, so joule per kilogram, of a given amount of water as the sum of three components. So the potential part, depending on the height, the pressure part, and the kinetic energy, depending on the speed. So if we don't have any production of mechanical work or so on, these three elements will remain constant and will, they will just change the, their ratio. And in hydro, we refer to the specific energy with the term, actually, to the gravity acceleration time the, uh, the head as the specific energy. So the key, the name you will hear a lot in hydropower plants is how much is the head. The head is the equivalent of the total specific energy that you have uh, available for uh, hydropower plants. The second key element, apart from the specific energy, is the mass flow rate, or the volumetric flow rate in this case, which is, as in the equation we saw before, the meter cube per second of water that we have, which is equal to the uh, speed times the area. If we want kilogram per second, we have to multiply by the density, right? So 
uh, meter cube per second multiplied by kilogram um, uh, per second, and then uh, by a kilogram per square meter, per cubic meter. And this gives us the final equation of the power we can harvest from a hydropower plant. It will be the multiplication of the mass flow rate times the specific enthalpy, which basically means if we want to, to have more power, we have either to increase the head, the specific energy, or to increase the mass flow rate. And these are the two things that will distinguish different power plants. Let's now look at every power station. So every power station can be a runoff river or dam, can be represented in this way. We normally call, we have an upper reservoir, we have a lower reservoir, which we indicate with U and L, and then we have the position one and two, which are after, just after and uh, before and after the turbine, okay? If we apply the Bernoulli principle on the high energy side and the low energy side, so before and after the turbine, so we can say that the energy we have here, okay, which is basically the water will be at atmospheric pressure, it will be at zero speed, and it will be at zeta u, will be equal to the total amount of energy that we have in input of the turbine, okay? We can apply the same equation after the turbine, so we can say that the uh, total amount of energy that we have available after the turbine will be equal to again the total amount of energy that we have here where the pressure will be again atmospheric, the speed will be zero, and uh, will, the, the height will be at uh, z, uh, z, uh, z, uh, z low. So if we want to know how much energy we have available here at the turbine between one and two, we just have to calculate the difference between the two. And the key result is that for every power plant, the specific energy, minus the losses, of course, uh, sorry, the specific energy will depend only, at the available at the turbine, will depend only on the height difference between the upper and the lower reservoir. So very simple, you can derive it just applying Bernoulli, and that is the energy that you see at the turbine. Questions up to now? Okay. So you can represent this in a diagram. This is the theoretical energy that you have if you have no losses in the system. This will be the losses coming, of course, from uh, the different pressure changes, the, ch the, the pipes and so on, that will induce some losses in the system that will increase with the mass flow rate. This this, if we combine this equation with the fact that we saw before that the power the total power will increase with the amount of uh, total discharge, so the total flow rate. We will have that we can, at the intersection of these two lines, we find the optimal design of a, new, of a hydropower plant, which gives us the opti optimal mass flow rate, the optimal discharge, and the, the optimal specific energy. So again, let's look at the turbine now, so let's focus on this area here. So at this area here, we can express the energy the, uh, with this equation, so we basically have to do the same equation I, I, I derived before. It will be equal to the pressure and velocity difference and so on. Before and after the turbine, we are basically at the same height level. So in this part, the head difference, the, so that the, um, let's say the height difference will not matter anymore. And we basically can see that we have two main components of uh, the energy that we can harvest at the turbine, which is basically the kinetic part, depending on the speed at the square, and the potential part depending on the pressure. And uh, the type of turbine that we use for a given power plant will depend between the ratio between these two elements. So if we have more, let's say, what is called the degree of reaction, is basically the amount, the ratio between the total amount of energy that we see at the turbine, uh, at the denominator, and at the numerator we put the potential energy, so the one coming from the pressure, okay? There is one last element from the physics that we need. It is uh, a very important result of, uh, which applies to every physical quantity actually, which is the Buckingham theorem, which you might have seen if you had already courses in thermodynamics and so on. It basically tells us, the Buckingham theorem tells us that uh, every physically meaningful um, quant uh, equation involving n variables can be represented with uh, a set of non-dimensional n minus k uh, coefficient, uh, let's say, uh, parameters, 
where k is the amount of dimensions, independent dimensions that are involved. So to make a simple example, space, time, and velocity, n equals 3, k equals 2, because the two involved dimensions are distance and time, the fundamental dimension. So we have one equation that we can derive, OK? Which is, of course, that uh, the speed is equal to space over time, right? So why are these dimensionless quantity and this theorem so important? Because they allow us to study things in scale. So if we have, for example, the Reynolds number or other a dimensional number, they will be the same between a small scale prototype and a very big power plant. So you can make a small model and you can predict what will happen in the, big, in the, in the large model, right? There is one very important parameter in, in hydro turbines, which is called the specific speed. The specific speed is a dimensionless quantity which summarizes the essential characteristic of a, of a water turbine. So if you want to know, if you, if you don't know anything about the water turbine, the first question you should ask is what is the specific speed? Because if you make the calculation here of the unit measure, this, the unit measure is, is the dimensionless in the sense that uh, they go away. And it depends on the discharge and it depends on the head. Okay? So very high discharge will mean a high specific speed. Very high head will mean a very low specific speed. So this, the, the important thing is that two turbines with the same specific speed are geometrically similar. So we can make a small scale prototype in a lab to study a very big, a very large prototype uh, in reality. So this, for example, you might know that there is a laboratory at EPFL working on uh, hydraulic machines. And for example, this is a video that comes from their work, which basically shows the, how a Francis turbine can be simulated at lab scale. Actually, in this specific case, the turbine is working without water. It's a particular mode that some electrical engineer in the room might know is called condenser mode. It's used to produce reactive power. Uh, so it's, it's when the turbine rotates without water, it will produce some reactive power in the grid to balance, to balance the grid. So, now we have all the basics. Let's see how, what are the main water turbines. So again, this concept, might, you might have heard them before. If not, if this is a very quick uh, uh, way of showing them. As I said, they can be classified on how the power is transferred from the water to the mechanical work. Okay? So again, always the same equation at the turbine. If we have only potential energy before and after the turbine, then we have the most uh, ancient way of producing hydroly, uh, uh, hydroelectric power, which is uh, a water wheel. We do not study this form of power because, of course, it's very low if we just look at the difference in height between before and after the water wheel. If we have a turbine that works only with speed difference, then we have what is called an impulse turbine. If it works only with pressure difference, we have a displacement turbine. If it works with a mixture of pressure and velocity and speed, then we have what is called a reaction turbine, okay? And this is a graph that shows you how the main kinds of turbines, so Pelton, Francis, Kaplan, and Ball, which are the, the four key um, uh, types of turbines, can be selected based on the side. So you have on the, on the y-axis the, the head, so the, the difference between the, the high and the low reservoir. Here, you have the specific speed, which is proportional to the discharge. And based on the, the way in which your site is made, you can select your turbine. So you will use a Pelton turbine. If you have a very high high difference and low uh, discharge, you would use a Kaplan turbine if you have a very low head, such as a river, for example, and very high discharge. So these are the, really the way to select, uh, to select the turbines that are used in practice. Let's look quickly. And let's, I put also here the other key equations that we need. So let's look quickly at the, how we classify turbine. So the first one is the Pelton. The Pelton is an impulse turbine. It works only based on difference in speed. Okay? So it will, uh, it's, it's a turbine made like that. It's a turbine that you would use if you have a very big power plant, very high difference in height, very small discharge, and so the head is up to two kilometers. And this turbine works 
uh, is a quite efficient turbine that works only due to the difference in speed and the impulse that is given from the speed of the water impacting the turbine. So here is another uh, video that comes from the same lab as before. This is a simulation, a simulation study that shows how a Pelton turbine works. So it's really just a very high speed jet which is impacting the bucket of the turbine. And this is uh, generating the mechanical power and transferring it to the motion. OK, so this is, this is how a Pelton turbine works. It's pretty simple. You have a very high discharge, a very high, uh, a very high mass flow difference. And then you have the, um, and this generates the, the mechanical power. Oops. OK, second, turbine, second type of turbine is the Francis. Francis turbine is, uh, it uses both the pressure and the speed. So it's the most used turbine in the world. It covers around 60% of the amount uh, of uh, electricity uh, produced, actually, or capacity installed of turbine. Uh, it's a very high efficient turbine, and it's using the biggest power plant in the world. So this one is the three. Uh, gorgeous uh, dam in China, I think, yes, uh, which has uh, 32 uh, turbine, Francis turbine installed, and each of them is 700 megawatt. It's the biggest power plant in the world, and it's also used in Itaipu in Brazil, which is not the biggest power plant in the world, but it's the one that uh, reaches the highest uh, electricity production. It made the production record in 2016. So just to give you an idea, this only power plant in Itaipu produces more uh, electricity than the entire, the, double the electricity than the entire Swiss electricity demand in one year. So this is, these are really, really big installations. And usually they are powered by Francis turbines. And as I told you, Francis turbine use a mix. Uh, well, let's see the components, first of all. Uh, so the Francis turbine is made like that. So you have a big, uh, the, the flow enters in the way, and uh, you have uh, a, a big part, uh, which is basically the, the entrance to the turbine, which is called the spiral casing. So the water enters through this cycle. It's, re it's optimized to enter in this way into the, um, into the turbine. And then you have two things, the stay veins and the guide veins, which are these two elements, which guide the water in order to enter with an optimized angle into the turbine. So actually, the study of Francis turbine is basically concent uh, concentrated on defining the optimal way in order to define this angle. And Francis turbine do not only use uh, speed, as I told you, they use speed and pressure. And actually, so after, and after you, uh, the water flows like that, and it exits through the draft tube. Uh, they use both speed and pressure, and actually, I, since we're also towards the end of the lecture, I show you a brief video that shows you how the two things are combined. And it's also interesting because you'll see how similar uh, the concepts are also to the, to the function of wind turbines, just they are just using another fluid. Francis turbines are the most preferred hydraulic turbines. It contributes about 60% of the global hydropower capacity mainly because they can work efficiently under a wide range of operating conditions. Most important part of Francis turbine is its runner. It is fitted with a collection of complex shaped blades. In a runner, water is entered radially and leaves axially. During the course of flow, water glides over runner blades. Francis turbine blades are specially shaped. You can note that blades are having thin airfoil cross section. So when water flows over it, a low pressure will be produced on one side and high pressure on the other side. This will result in a lift force. You can also note one more peculiar thing about the blade. It is having a bucket kind of shape towards the outlet. So water will hit it and produce an impulse force before leaving the runner. Both impulse force and lift force will make the runner rotate. 
So France's turbine is not a pure reaction turbine. Of course, it's for. Okay, so uh, this is what I wanted to show you is that uh, this is why France's turbines are so uh, used in practice is because, as you can see here, uh, they cover a large range of operation due to the fact that they do not only use pressure, they do not only use velocity, they use a bit of, of, it, a bit of both, which uh, allows them to be uh, used in most applications. So there is a bit of the Bernoulli effect of lift, the same as we use in wind turbines. There is a bit of the impulse that we use in uh, Pelton turbines, uh, given by the difference in speed. Last types of turbines that we have is the turbines that we normally use in the run of rivers installation. So if you have a river, you have a very low head, right? I mean, you don't have a big difference between the upper and the lower side. You have a big mass flow rate. And so you use uh, both the pressure and velocity. But usually in this case, what you normally use is uh, uh, mostly uh, the pressure in this case. And the two turbines that uh, you can use in this kind of situation are the Kaplan and the bulb turbine. Uh, the Kaplan turbine is an evolution of the Francis turbine that was made in, in order to be used at very low head, where the, the Francis turbine was not uh, possible to use anymore. So, as I said, we, they are a bit smaller normally than Pelton and uh, Francis turbine, but still quite big. And uh, they're used for low head and high discharge, and as other turbines, but the Kaplan turbine is the one that suffers the most from cavitation problems. So cavitation you might have studied in the other courses, but conceptually it basically means that when you have a very low pressure after the turbine, the pressure is low enough that the water evaporates. So you have bubbles that heat against the turbine and they create so that they, they wear it out. And this is a key problem in uh, it also in Francis turbines and so on. But I would say Kaplan is the one in which it is more pronounced, so is the one in which it is more important for the design. And in terms of principle, it is not so different from the video you saw on the Francis turbine, actually. Uh, there is also the bulb. The bulb turbine is basically the same as the Kaplan turbine. It's just that uh, in around the 1930s, I think in France, they came up with this idea of placing the turbine inside really these big pipes. So instead of having like a, a Kaplan turbine in which the flow enters vertically and then the turbine is vertically orientated. Here you put the turbine already inside a big channel full of water. And it's just a way to design the turbine in a way which is more efficient and uh, less uh, uh, costly. So you find these two kinds of applications. And here is just to sum up. So just remember uh, about hydro, the main thing is remembering that uh, uh, you would change, you would define what turbine to use based on the head and based on the discharge. You use Pelton turbine for high head and low discharge, Kaplan turbine for uh, low head and high discharge, and Francis turbine for intermediate values, which is the most used. And I just show you here quickly that hydro is a rather mature technology, but there is still research being done. For example, this is an example of uh, micro turbines. So there is. Uh, uh, actually, this project here in Switzerland is also a, um, uh, a, a startup which evaluates how to uh, inst install very small turbines of around 5 to 25 kilowatt inside water pipes that serve, for example, small villages in Ballet. Normally there you have to decrease the pressure manually because the pressure is too high. So the idea that these people had is to harvest this uh, energy, this mechanical power that's available in form of pressure differential in terms of mechanical, uh, in terms of mechanical energy. So this is a bit how it works. Again, the, the working principle is exactly the same as in the other turbines. Uh, there, is no, there is no difference. You still have the head, you still have discharge to design. But these are just applications that, can, that are, let's say, what is researched today about hydro. Because when you look at Francis Kaplan and Pelton turbine, these are mature technologies that uh, engineers know very well how to design and have probably reached already the maximum possible efficiency. We are talking about 96-97%, so we cannot do much better than that in harvesting the power. So, let's look at how hydro is integrating in the energy system very like, just the last five minutes. So, as I said, you have hydro storage, hydro runoff river power plants. So, these are the two hydroelectric schemes. You see a runoff river power plant using a Kaplan turbine or using a bulb turbine in this case. 
The costs are very project specific, so it's very difficult to say how much a hydropower plant will cost because the cost, of course, comes from different reasons uh, and they depend on the project. So you might have permissions to purchase the land, you might have people to move. It's quite complicated. Overall, though, we can say that hydropower is for sure a very competitive technology in terms of cost. The prices can go down to 20, 30 cents per, to 20, to 2, 3 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity produced. And you see that although the prices vary quite a lot, the important thing is that the construction cost can really vary based on the single application. Of course, it has also impacts. Actually, hydropower plants are the ones that uh, co uh, in history has caused quite a lot of disasters. Uh, you might, uh, uh, of course, you might uh, remember some of the big disasters. Let's just say that in terms of emissions, so people tend to think, okay, this dam is very big. It will have a very big impact to, to be built. So if we look at the total greenhouse gas emission, which is uh, the construction, <coughs> operation and maintenance, and the commissioning, if we account for the total emissions divided by the total kilowatt hour that this turbine will produce, actually the emissions are overall very low. So if you compare it to other sources, hydro is one of the most uh, or the best one for climate change and CO2 emissions. Of course, there are issues. Actually, I, I come from a region in Italy where there was a major disaster in 1963. Uh, there was the Vaillon disaster in which about 2,000 people were killed. Uh, quite impressive in the sense that this was caused by the fact that the dam was not correctly constructed and part of the mountain fell inside the reservoir when it was full. Actually, the dam did not collapse, but the pressure and the, and the, and the explosion basically coming uh, has killed about 2,000 people. So these are, of course, quite scary. And uh, you can see also here was uh, something that was uh, happened in... Uh, um, in, in, in Russia some years ago, which caused uh, about uh, uh, 75 uh, uh, deaths. And, uh, well. Almost a month since the Sayana Shushinska power plant tragedy. We don't have a very good connection. New CCTV right? footage has been made public. A janitor wiped floors in the machine hall just minutes before a deadly mass of water destroyed the three generators, burying 75 workers under the rubble. Panic employees rushed to the exit. So just to show you that uh, operation has been going on. this was due to the collapse of a turbine. So a turbine at, at the moment collapsed and there was a big flood. And actually, but, but actually the biggest disaster you might, uh, you might know about it was in China some years ago. In um, 1975, there was a major disaster linked to, uh, to Hydro, which killed 170,000 people due to an extremely high event of precipitation that flooded a huge area. So it is a, it is a technology which actually has caused uh, some direct accidents. If you look at direct deaths coming in the last century from hydro energy sources, uh, from um, energy source, the direct deaths I'm talking about is quite high. However, if you compare it, there was a study made by Forbes showing how many deaths uh, a kilowatt hour of electricity or of energy is responsible for. If we compare the indirect effects also on climate change and pollution and so on, uh, it is still... So hydro is, I would say, higher than other renewables, basically due to this big disaster that there was in the past. But compared to fossil fuels, it's still quite low. And just to tell you a last thing, so in the model that you have in your, uh, in your project, uh, you have the implementation of hydro as it is today in Switzerland. So we implemented uh, uh, hydro with the 8 uh, gigawatt, uh, gigawatt of hydro dams and 3.8 gigawatt of hydro river that we have. We also take into account the legislation. So we took into account that there was a law in Switzerland reducing the amount of uh, uh, energy that can be produced by rivers because at some point in order to maintain the flow rate of rivers we have to bypass the turbines okay so these are already included in your model and uh, if uh, we have already profiles that are optimized for storage this means that hydro dams in switzerland are used for seasonal storage so shifting production of electricity from summer to winter and uh, the profiles the monthly profiles that you have in the, in the model you're using for your project already takes this into account. And also it takes into account that there can be new installations, so your model will be able to choose if it's optimal or not to install new power. The maximum power that we can install in Switzerland is around 5,000 gigawatt hours a year, so it's not very big. 
And if, you, if your model, or you choose in your model to install more, more hydro, you'll also have an, an additional amount of storage, of shifting of production that will be implemented by the model. So if you're interested in, in seeing how this works, we can, have, we can either ask me, or you can also check uh, uh, section 1.2.1 1, uh, of my thesis, where I describe a bit uh, the situation of hydro uh, in Switzerland and how, wind, and how hydro, hydro turbines are used in Switzerland. So to conclude, uh, the take-home uh, message is that, uh, as you say, hi, as I said, hydro is the most developed uh, technology. It's quite a mature technology. We know we know it. Uh, we know it very well. Uh, many countries are already trying to maximize it, especially in Europe. Some countries have already reached the maximum potential. Um, what is important is remembering the key elements of the physics, and especially one question at the exam, for example, could be to describe which turbine you would use for a given condition of uh, head and discharge. Uh, so you can write this down in your 15-page notes and <laughs> already right now. And uh, again, it's, it's a competitive technology uh, in terms of cost, and it has a fundamental uh, role in uh, balancing the grid for pumped uh, storage and so on, which we will discuss then in the storage lecture, which will be again by myself in two weeks. So with that, uh, I, that's the end for Hydro. If you have any questions, otherwise I'll see you in two weeks.